In the great words of the Pirate King, Goldie Roger, first you get the wealth, then you get the fame, then you get the power, then you get the punishment of being executed for being the Pirate King. Bad man, very bad. But not before impregnating a woman off screen with your will of D. But that's definitely not the full story here. Contrary to popular belief, romance absolutely exists in One Piece. In fact, the most notorious shipper in the One Piece fandom is Echiro Oda himself. And during this video, I am going to reveal a canon relationship that you had no idea idea existed. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. My name is Liam and I don't often talk about romance, but when I do, it involves fictional pirates. But I suspect that a lot of people won't actually click on this video because it's not about fruit and there's no punch fighting and just who cares about the, the, the love and stuff? Well, you should. Because surprisingly enough, romance is becoming an increasingly prevalent and important aspect of One Piece. And come to think of it, you know, I really should have planned this video for Valentine's Day. And right now I'm recording this on, on the 20th of February, so that, that was very poorly timed. Because in this video, we are going to answer the following questions. One, why is there no romance in One Piece? Two, why is the assertion in question one wrong? And three, why do fictional pirates kissing and intercoursing hold the key to discovering what the One Piece is? Well, to figure that out, we've got a date with Man of Culture, Otto von Valentine, and Kim, who is, who is just Kim, but all three of whom committed the sensual act of subscribing to the Grand Line Review which will result in consistent injections of One Piece culture being administered directly into your YouTube feeds. And if you want to be our next subscriber of the day, then hit the button and please do say hi in the comments below if you are a new member of the Grand Fleet. Welcome. All right, so many of you will already know this. Some of you won't, maybe most of you won't. I don't know the exact breakdown, but Oda has actually been asked about romance before. In the SBS section of volume 34, one amorously inclined reader inquired, doesn't anyone on Luffy's crew fall in love? Will there never be a tale of onboard romance? Sanji is the exception in this case. I'm just wondering. To which Oda replied, but they do. They're all in love with adventure, which you would think would put a stop to this video altogether. However, it's quite relevant to note that this question was posed in 2004 and a lot has changed since then. In fact, when Oda first began work on the One Piece prototype, he was only 17 years old and very, very few 17 year old boys set out to write stories integrating complex human relationships like romancy stuff. No, we want rubber boys punching other non rubber boys. But Oda is now a whopping 47 years old. He's since gotten married, had children and acquired three decades worth of life experience, which has not only changed him, but also heavily influenced his life's work. Romance now not only exists in One Piece, but it's evolving into a core tenant, even among certain straw hats. So in current One Piece, there are three basic types of relationships. The first of which is a one-sided relationship. This is your very classic one character pines over another, usually for some sort of comical effect. In the early days of One Piece, a good example of this would be Sanji with literally any woman. And in the modern days of One Piece, a great example of this would be Sanji with literally any woman. And in the future, a great example example of this is going to be Sanji with literally any, well, okay, you get the idea. Sanji is a menace to society and potentially a bit of a creeper because remember there was that one time when he sniffed Perona's butt on Sabadi, which was, well, that was something. Interestingly enough though, that was the event that confirmed to us that Perona can actually use her devil fruit to float. Like this isn't an astral projection. This is 100% Perona because Sanji can smell her. Moving swiftly on, this represents Oda's, how shall we say, more juvenile views on romance, that it was mostly a feature to be used for comedy. However, it was also slightly more versatile than that, and it was also used to build villains, like say Absalom, whose trademark character quirk was being a pervert. And then slightly more modern times, Van de Decken also falls into that model, being characterized for his desire to marry and control the underaged mermaid Shirohoshi. And of course, there is the most famous one-sided relationship of all time, which would be Luffy and Boa Hancock. Probably by far the most relevant one as well, because it has had legitimate story ramifications we avoided conflict with a whole warlord of the sea just because Hancock fell for Luffy harder than the career of a YouTuber after a racist remark on the internet. But because I was interested, I asked everyone in the Grand Fleet to tell me what Luffy's response would be if Hancock asked him out on a date. And one of our top contenders came from Laurie Fisher who painted the following word picture. 
Hancock opens with, Luffy, can I take you out on a date? Yuck, no thanks, those taste terrible. You can take me out on a meat though. So that's just a bit of dried fruit humor for you then. Come to think of it as a fruit man, when Luffy got sucked dry by crocodile on alabaster, would that have made him a date? I suppose he also could have been a prune, raisin, apricot, or if he was feeling particularly pompous, perhaps even a fig. So that didn't quite work out for Hancock, but you know she is adamant about this date, so we're gonna check back in with her skin later on. This is where things get much more interesting though, because our next type of romantic entanglement are the relationships that canonically exist, but are strategically hidden from the audience. A rather wild example of this would be Doflamingo and Viola. This is never explicitly stated in One Piece, but the two of them called each other by pet names, thus suggesting a rather intimate relationship, one that was confirmed by Oda in the SPS of volume 83. There is a deep secret setting I can't tell you about though. I inform the super advisor about it, but since it's a pretty adult part of the story, it remains hidden in the shonen manga, which One Piece is. To all adults, please try to imagine yourselves. Dress Rosa is a truly passionate country. So yeah, they banged. Another implied relationship would be that of Rayleigh and Shaki. Again, it's heavily implied, but I suppose not confirmed that they are a married couple. However, they're also, how shall we say, much more open than your traditional pairing of fictional pirates. In fact, the very first time we meet Shaki, she informs the Straw Hats that she hasn't seen Rayleigh in six whole months and suspects that, quote, I think he's got a girl somewhere and stays with her. So Rayleigh and Shaki, polyamorous, confirmed, question mark. Here's another fun one though, Smoker. Who do you think he has eyes for? A lot of people would probably jump to Tashiki. However, Oda has other ideas because Smoker has a little something something happening with Hina. Just like Doflamingo and Viola, the two have rather close ways of referring to each other. Hina delightfully calling him Smoker-kun, despite being neither older nor higher in rank than him. And Smoker rather simply refers to her as Hina with no honorifics whatsoever. And the two of them were featured on the cover of chapter 586 on what appears to be a date. Hina got wildly intoxicated and Smoker is insisting that they take a taxi camel back to wherever it is they're staying. The key thing about all of these relationships though is that they're more for background flavor. They exist more to assist Oda with writing in the same sort of way that actors create a personal backstory for the character when they invest themselves in a role. And speaking of invested, Bull Hancock has concocted another dating scheme courtesy of Grand Fleet member Josh Haas. Not wanting to be misunderstood again, Boa makes it clear that she's asking Luffy for a different kind of date, which is met with Luffy's inquiry of, what's a date? Well, that is kind of like a party with only the two of us. That sounds dumb. Parties are more fun with more people. Let's invite everyone. Luffy, that's not. Oi, Zoro, Sanji, Usopp, let's go on a date. And then the stage directions here say that Hancock makes distressed gurgles, which, which I guess sounds like I don't know, I, I can't do distressed goggles. In any case, this also went pretty horribly for Hancock, again. But don't worry, because she will still have one more chance to seduce Luffy later on. But this leads to the third type of relationship. The most recent kind, which are just the flat out confirmed and surprisingly story relevant romances. Because our suave Casa di Nova Oda has become much more of a romantic, particularly in the post time skip era. And his relative maturity is on full display in by by far the most well fleshed out relationship in the series between one Vince Moksanji and multiple personalities of Charlotte Pudding. This is legitimately a well executed romance plot that is integral to the arc of Whole Cake Island. It's not just about comedy, it's not about creating a villain, and it's certainly not relegated to the background. This is a relationship that changes both characters in what is really quite a classic romantic setup. You know, you've got the whole, oh, I'm gonna fake being in love with this person, but oh no, I actually fell in love with them, which we're gonna call the Pudding Delay which causes her a huge inner crisis and leads to her becoming a central piece of drama between two factions. Does Pudding remain loyal to her primarily sadistic and bloodthirsty family, or does she side with the man she fell in love with? As much as I did complain, admittedly at great length about Pudding when reading Whole Cake Island Weekly, I have a much stronger appreciation for her in retrospect. And as for Sanji, he kind of has the inverse journey. He initially actually falls for Pudding at first and then has to deal with her betrayal with the two events eventually finding a somber, tragic middle ground in one of the most heart-wrenching of an arc in, I think, ever? I mean, apart from Sabadi, I suppose. That's, that's pretty stiff competition. But that aside, Oda has integrated romantic elements as a mainstay across the board. 
In that very same arc, we follow the story of Capone and Chiffon, which has less twists and turns, but it's a tale of strong bonds of love and the importance of family. Something I have no doubt that Oda took from his own experience as a husband and father. On a more comical note, Dress Rosa also featured one of my favorite couples in the series, which is Sai and Baby Five, which was definitely more of a last minute pairing, but it was done in a really satisfying way. One that wasn't just playing for laughs, some laughs were had, but, but not all, but it also successfully capped off an action set piece. And then the two of them even had their own wedding play out as a brief cover story, which was fantastic. In extremely modern times, we also have the tale of Odin and Toki. They have what I would call a very successful three panel relationship, where Toki implies that she's interested in a great big part of Odin, after which point we have an immediate time skip and an introduction to a baby Momonosuke. But this is one of those times where I really don't think that early Oda would have included even that three panel development. That's just not quite where his head was at. But here's the big picture point now. Most series like One Piece conclude with end of Shonen Syndrome, the point at which romance is finally allowed to bear fruit and all of the characters tend to pair off and live happily ever after. Now the Straw Hat, sure, they're in love with adventure for now. Eventually that adventure is going to end though. And mark my words, by the end of One Piece, the vast majority of them will settle down with their assorted partners. For example, for Usopp, that would be Kaya. In regards to Sanji, that's probably pudding. For Zoro, either Hiyori or Toshigi is looking pretty good. Chopper has his own mink girlfriend with Milky. And if we're counting Vivi, she is almost certainly set up to get it on with Koza. The female straw hats are, well, they're a bit more difficult to discern because I think they're purposely kept unpartnered, even in an implied sense, probably for the for the benefit of the teenage boy audience. And then I suppose there's the straw hats who aren't really seen as romantic possibilities, such as Brooke, who will probably just settle down with Laboon. And there's Frankie, who might just build himself some sort of ship-based partner, which would certainly bring new meaning to the concept of shipping. And then there's Jinbei, who has always been in love with the concept of duty. And then there's Luffy. And come to think of it, did Boa finally manage to seduce him? Well, Grand Fleet member, bitch, Deathlift 10, that's a name. That Grand Fleet member has the answer. This time around, our debaucherous yet determined pirate empress isn't in the mood to have her words misconstrued. So she decides to be as straightforward as possible and asks Luffy, hey, may I be queen? of the pirates. And to this, Luffy is immediately offended, putting on a crown, makeup, and a gown before claiming, no, I will be both king and queen of the pirates. Luffy then touches his left hand to his face and reveals himself to be Bon Clay in disguise. So bad luck, Boa. You weren't even talking to the real Luffy and you still got rejected. Talk about a gomu gomu no. But for a whopping yes, how about this next video? Because there's always more to learn, explore, and experience with this wonderful series. So I look forward to seeing you there.